Welcome to the Lead More Podcast. I'm your host, John T. Meyer. Now, the Lead More Podcast is the show where we sit down with leaders of today to help inspire and hopefully create more leaders for tomorrow. Because I believe the world needs more leaders, and I want you, if you're listening, I want you to be the next one. You are one. You can be one. And that's what we believe here at Lead More. Anyone can be a leader, no matter where you're from, where you went to school, your income, your job title, your race, your gender. We just need you to step up and lead and have the passion and the desire. So on this show, we sit down with leaders and we learn from them. And this week is no different. I'm really excited. Today, we have Eric Jorgensen from the show. Eric is a longtime tech guy. He worked at a company called Zarly. Interestingly enough, goes way back to really almost even pre-Lemonly days. One of our very first clients was Zarly. Before Lemonly was truly even Lemonly, we were still figuring it out doing some design work. We made some merch and some swag, and it led to one of our first infographics that made it on the front page of TechCrunch when Zarly announced their funding and really cool story. So Eric's done that for a long time. He since has gone out on his own. He did a really, really fascinating project. He wrote a book, curated slash wrote a book uh, called Navalmanac, where it aggregates all of the content and thoughts and philosophies of Naval Ravikant who is a famous sort of philosopher, angel investor, and founder from Silicon Valley. So really great book. Encourage you to check that out. But a core thesis of that book and Naval's thinking is on the topic of leverage and how you can use leverage, the different forms of leverage, time and people, uh, tools to, to help maximize and create leverage in your life. And so that's what we talk about today with Eric. He now has a course about this topic. He's a really smart, thoughtful, deep thinker. And so I asked him some questions around that. We also talk about what it's like. Zarly has this crazy kind of coaching tree, I like to call it, where a CEO, Bo Fishback, has created a lot of other founders and entrepreneurs from that organization, those early days of Zarly, who have gone on to do other things. So awesome conversation. A fellow Midwest dude, Eric's from Kansas City. Uh, well, he's from Michigan, lives in Kansas City, but both count as Midwest. So you're going to love this episode of the Lead More Podcast with Eric Jorgensen. Let's take a listen. All right, everybody, welcome to another edition of the Lead More Podcast. I'm here with the Viking, Eric Jorgensen. How are you, sir? I'm good, John. I'm good. <laughs> and uh, back home in Michigan for the weekend, right? Or the week? Yeah, it's it's the uh, time of year when Michigan is is about the best place in America, and not many people know it. So, uh, trying like to it. take advantage of it. That's sort of like here in South Dakota, where we have about three weeks of good spring, three weeks of good fall, and then it's just cold and construction. It was <laughs> yep. like the other two seasons. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so, uh, well, let's do let's jump right in. Uh, we were just talking before we hit record. You've had a you know, I guess we've all gone through change this last year, but you've had quite a bit of change over the last uh, few months. Um, walk us through what are you doing now? What were you doing prior? Um, and then we'll get into later kind of where that's headed. Yeah, I, th- I think uh, maybe my, my, my pie chart has shifted a little bit of like where, where my attention is. Um, and I've been really lucky. So published maybe six months ago now, um, published the album. Okay. Ravikant. Um and that has kind of led in a really interesting direction where I'm starting to have more and more conversations about, about that book and about the questions that people have left after that book. And so I've started kind of creating more, um, actually working on a, a, a launched now, um, a course um, about leverage, which is like a concept from this book. And I, I became W2-less. Um, so I have more time to focus on that. Um, and uh I, I'm like nothing to announce yet, but like chipping away on another book um, cool. and just getting to focus on a lot of side projects. And it's, it's a good time. It's an exciting place to be. So before you got, uh, I love, I've never heard it that way. W2 list uh, a decade at a, a startup. Was it a, probably a decade, right? You were there a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Just over 10 years as early. Um, yeah. It was, yeah, recently acquired and uh, it was a good time to just kind of sidle out the side door for me. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah explore something new. So on, on the topic of leadership, we'll talk briefly about Zarly, just because we were, you know, Lemonly has a little bit of intersection with the early days of Zarly, one of our very first clients making a t-shirt of stickers of all things. It's a great um, t-shirt. I still have it. <laughs> That's great. It's iconic. <laughs> Z money. Um, 
What uh, what did you learn about leadership? I've heard so many. I know a lot of folks who worked at Zarlite. I've heard. I, I've never heard anything but great things about Bo Fishback as an incredible leader. Um, so you were right out of college, young guy. Like, what what did you learn about leadership while working at Zarlite? Yeah, I really um, have always admired Bo and think that he is such a um, uniquely kind of like kind and brilliant guy. Um, I think he is really he's really understanding and really trusting of people. Um, and that is, that is pretty unfailing and it's to an extreme degree that like, <laughs> until you have kind of seen it happen, you can't, it's hard to believe that people are that trusting um, sure. and that like uh, that generous. Um, and so I, I, yeah, I just feel cool. kind of super lucky to have spent some time together and, uh, and to see that and, and hopefully learn from that example. Yeah. Well, we were saying, you know, the, the, I use the phrase like the coaching tree, kind of like an NFL, right? Like the coaching tree from Bo and yeah. the folks at Zarly. It's going to be really fun. It already is and fascinating, but it's, it's going to be interesting to see where all those folks go and things they go do. Yeah. And he attracted incredible talent. Um, you know, that's kind of now all over the country and all over the, you know, the Valley, the digital cloud Valley now. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it'll be, I mean, it's been an exciting 10 years already to see where some of those folks have gone and um, where they'll continue to go. And were you, I, I can't, I remember because of Bo, like Zarley always had a little bit of KC DNA because of the Kauffman Foundation. Were you always, or you did the Valley or you've been remote sort of by choice or how'd you end up in KC? Uh, yeah, I was actually going to move to Kansas City for the Kauffman Foundation. So I was, Bo was going to hire me there uh, as like an intern. And then I was literally my first day of work. I was sitting there filling out paperwork and he's like, so uh, I'm going to leave this place. I'm going to go start a company. Uh, do you want to come with me or do you want to stay here? Uh, and I was like, I just want to work for you. Like wherever you're going, I'm, I'm in. Um, and so I just never even finished filling out the paperwork at Kaufman <laughs> and just started kind of working for Zarley. Um, so early Zarley, we spent, I spent maybe six months in Kansas city. Um, and then when we raised money, uh, moved out to San Francisco, or raised our A round from Kleiner, moved out to San Francisco um, for a few years. Um, so yeah, that was that was kind of the cadence. Then we moved the company back to Kansas City in 2015, 16. Um, uh -huh. Kind of reoriented our headquarters there for the next few years. Cool. All right, well, let's get into, you mentioned the book. Uh, uh, you published that six months ago, the Navalmanac. Awesome book, I've read yes. it. Um, Thank you. Uh, tell me, it seemed like just this is outwardly, so I might be wrong, but like following you on Twitter, it was a project that you seem to be working on for a long time. Like it was just kind of, and, and I think that's pretty natural for books, but like talk about the kernel of the idea versus like where you ended up. Was that where you thought you would be or did it evolve or? Oh, it evolved immediately. Um, like a Chia pet. Um, I mean, I just, I just had this like kernel of an idea that I tweeted. It was just like, um, this podcast that Naval had done with Shane Parrish had just come out hmm. on the knowledge project. It was an amazing, amazing podcast. I had listened to it a few times and I was just kind of lamenting the fact that so much like timeless wisdom was kind of in this format. That's not indexable, searchable, not particularly sure. timeless. Like it gets buried. And, um, in thinking about that, I thought the same thing applied to everything that Naval had shared on Twitter that I've been following for, you know, 10 years. Was this um, pre like the Epic well, uh, wealth thread or a yeah. post or it was, okay. it was pre pre Epic wealth thread. Um, but post, you know, a ton of, you know, blogging, yeah. you know, Nivy and Naval had been blogging for years. I mean, they started venture hacks like way back in the day. So, um, there's, there's been a lot that I've learned from him just kind of, as a company builder and investor in the Valley um, before he became kind of like a philosophical, you know, like faceless yeah. Twitter account. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So th there was- I tried to uh, explain Naval to my wife. Uh, it was a weird conversation trying to explain like who this- Yeah, you sound a little bit like a cultist, I think for yeah. people, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so there's a, like that, that, that's where that kernel came from of like, I've learned a ton from this guy this uh, media format is like not is is not matching up with the quality of the content. Um, mm, so like, like and I just kind of tweeted a like a little like, hey, maybe I should compile like the book of knowledge and just like put together some transcripts. And uh, I woke up to find that Naval had retweeted that and like 5000 people responded to the poll and were like, hell yeah, like do this immediately. Um, and so there was this instant kind of scope creep where I was like, oh, this will be like a two month project and I'll just like slap some things together and here we go. And as soon as he was kind of like, yeah, no, I'm happy to help. And like kind of 
support this in some way. Um, I was like, oh, okay, then like, we're going to do this thing right. And I immediately went into like poor Charlie's almanac mode and gathered like everything mm. I could ever find that he ever wrote and like laid it all out. And it was like well over a million words of source material or 10 years and 20,000 tweets and just like a massive sort of thing that I tried to organize and compile and categorize and like turn into this um, tome. And the first versions, like my poor alpha readers were just like, they just got like this fat stack of paper um, and a red pen. And, and most of them were like, this is a, a lot. I was like, yep. Um, like I was interested in everything that he had ever sure. talked about for the most part, you know, all, all the categories and stuff like that. But, you know, whether it was blockchain or education or futurism or investing or startup building or whatever. Um, and so I just started kind of trimming this down and getting feedback from people and turning it more into the book that, that you see today. Interesting. And I was going to ask at some point, I assume that you guys had connected during the process, but maybe it sounds like almost immediately pretty early on you spoke to him or. Yeah. I mean, we did all of this through email. Like we never spoke oh. live. Um, it was just kind of e email and DMS and he was responsive and easygoing and, um, but you know, he, he did not edit every word and didn't, he was just like, yeah, dude, like just make cool. something good. Um, I was like, okay, <laughs> no pressure. Here we go. Um, I almost, I've never written a book, but part of me, like the, the gut reaction is like, oh, these aren't your work. Like you're just compiling and you're organizing, you're editing. Like this should be fairly easy, but it almost sounds harder because you have to take someone else's ideas and, f and try to do them justice and connect the dots and talk about that. Yeah. It's, it's a little more like doing a, a giant conceptual jigsaw puzzle than it is, you know, painting a painting. Um, yeah. And so it was just a different kind of challenge. Uh, there was a lot of times when I wished I could be like edit more aggressively or, but it's really like, you have to kind of, you can shape the jigsaw puzzles pieces a little bit, but you got to like find the right one for these million different things. And there's like different versions of the same piece that you have to find out which ones connect better and then create kind of a contiguous thread um, through everything. So, you know, you can imagine you hear compilation sometimes and you're just kind of like, sure. Oh, that's like not a lot of value add. Um, but like, this is three years and five full passes of edits and hundreds and hundreds of hours, plus like professional proofreading and copy editing and line editing and stuff. So um, there's, a, there, I, I have heard nothing but good feedback about people who are kind of like, I wasn't really sure what to expect, but like, yeah. You clearly did a ton of work to make this really accessible and really readable and really referenceable and all of these kind of different, um, just like, and then just the format itself, like putting it into a book and making it a readable, shareable, like package that people kind of know what to do with makes it so much more accessible and so much more timeless for people. Um, yeah. And I've kind of been amazed by that transformation as well. Well, I think of these million words were said at, at different times, at different places and different years. And so like he never yeah. intended these to all be, you know, compiled into a book. So yeah. it's gotta be. And, and there's conflicting ideas and like different, sure. different timelines and explanations of things in different places. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a ton of work. Um, it was a, it was a lot of work and uh, it's gratifying to see it done. And it was, so much harder than I thought it was going to be when I started out, you know, even once it, it grew in scope, I was kind of like, Oh, this will be, you know, maybe six months. And uh, yeah, it was, it was three years of solid, like nights and weekends. And, um, and then the investment to make, you know, like a professionalized version of yeah. this that uh, I used to for, which was I, an amazing partner. Yeah. And I believe you self-published, right. Or is that with scribe then? Yeah. It's kind of an interesting, I don't even know what the right term they're like a professional self-publisher. So like okay. as an author, you retain your copyright, um, but you get access to the talents of like a professional cover designer and page layout and proofreading and ah. um, kind of structural editing. So there's all kinds of different um offerings that they have, but basically like you can show up with like a very polished Google doc and they will kind of take it from there and help you turn it into cool. a really cool, like professional book. Um, but, but without kind of the like weird draconian contract of like a normal publisher. Um, yep. and they don't have the distribution, you know, punch that like random house does sure. or whatever, but that is just a different agreement. Well, and speak, we'll get to, to leverage next, but that's how you yeah. then, of course, use the internet to get that distribution, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can you can bring that to the table. So talk about, uh, we'll get to this concept of leverage and kind of the, how you've extracted this theme from that book. But I'm just curious, what's the, uh, 
what's maybe the most interesting story that's happened since you published the book? Cause I'm sure there's been some incredible ones and conversations and DMS. Yeah. I mean, the, the most rewarding is just the whole category of people who have a life changing, like either insight or inspiration as a result of it. Um, or people who say that it changed how they approach their career or their trajectory or their mindset. Um, and it's really like, you know, a hundred individual emails about like people who went out of their way enough to feel compelled to say something, um, is really like, those are super rewarding. Um, so yeah, fair amount of DMS and, and emails from people that are just like, I, I totally like blew, blew my little brother's mind and it totally changed how he's going to approach his whole life. Cause he's, you know, 20 and trying to figure out like where to focus his career and energy. And like, I remember some of those, you know, the quake books or whatever they're called, you know, when you're um, encountering some of these ideas for the first time and like the articulation and impact of those is like just such higher magnitude because you've yeah. never heard of these things before and you're sure. like, oh, that's how that works. Holy shit. Um, <laughs> and those are just like, I know how that feels and it feels really uh, rewarding and fun to kind of like know that you're creating some of those for other people. Um, well, that's a, a that's such a justification for what you did to to get it. Like when you talked about putting it in that a better medium to sort of archive and live. Because if if I if you sent that that twenty something kid like a hundred links of podcasts and articles and like and tweets from him, would he go through it? Would it make sense? Would it have the same impact? No way. So, yeah, it is very um, and, and it's interesting that like podcasts and Twitter is still such a subculture, right? Like they're hugely popular and they're way bigger than they used to be. But if you try to send somebody who's not a Twitter person or not a podcast person, like those resources, like they don't even know what to do with them or where to start. Um, So yeah, I think that there's just a huge opportunity to kind of transform insights across media. Um, And, and there's a huge value to be unlocked there. And I think that's, that's underrated. Cool. I like that. So, um, why leadership? Why the lead more podcast? Uh, I want to ask you. I don't know if this is intentional or not, or like if you know it was a passion project. But now, you know, they say if, you, if you're building a brand or being a creator, how do you become the blank blank guy or the blank blank girl, right? And to me, you are now like the leverage guy in my head. And you know, whether you wanted to or not, talk to me about sort of how this one particular theme has evolved from writing that book and talking about leverage. Yeah. I think it's, um, it's interesting to kind of look back and deconstruct this a little bit. So like I have, I have one answer that's kind of like, I can tell you how one project led to another, but I can also kind of look at my personal history and see like how this idea appealed to me and like why I kind of got, how I feel like qualified to keep expanding and exploring the thread. Um, so, I mean, practically it was just kind of like the, there's the chapter in the book called find a position of leverage. And there's like mm-hmm. one story and one example, um, that show the power of leverage. And, you know, Naval says like we're living in an age of leverage and there's, you know, media and code and software that are giving individuals kind of this ability to have massive impact. And it's a tantalizingly kind of small tidbit for something that could certainly be a whole book um, or universe unto itself. And so I get a lot of questions from people that are like, hey, uh, you know that chapter? Like, where else can I read? Is there Are there books on leverage? Are there like, where else can I read more about this and keep exploring this concept? Um, and actually don't have like a great answer for them. Like there is no leverage book yet. There is no, um, there are people who are writing posts about it. There's people who are kind of throwing the word around. Um, and it's a little bit of a confusing thing because when you go Googling for it, you find a bunch of stuff about like leverage as a debt instrument, like yes. you know, the, the financial jargon for leverage. Um, or I was even going to say when I, when I told my wife about, you know, talking with you and, and this yeah. book and, and, and her, her initial reaction was like, when people say like on a, in a conversation, maybe mm-hmm. I have leverage over you. Right. Because I know something yeah. you don't know. And I was like, no, no, this is like simple machine. Like, childhood yeah. like i can yeah. lift 10 times more because i have a lever type of exactly thing. yeah the, that's the other connotation is people like to have leverage over um to have yeah. like control over and it's it is neither of those things it is yeah exactly simple machine um and i think like this think of it as effort amplification right like how can you do the work that helps you do more work 
um, yeah. either in the timed, future or automatically or yeah. like time does not have to equal output right like yeah ult- ultimately um time and eventually probably energy are like the right denominators okay. to evaluate leverage in um and so you know i have a, another friend that i runs a an agency that i talked to about this and he's like you know he started as a consultant and that was like one to one um and mm-hmm. he's now you know eight years into building an agency and, and thinking of it in terms of leverage he's like I worked, you know, 40 hours this week. My company worked 682 hours this week at billable, right? And so like that leverage grew over time through team and tools and all of these things. And so you can kind of um, chart it out and think about it that way. Like I'm limited to one-to-one, but I can do work like hiring or managing or leading that allows me to increase my impact. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, so that's as people clamored for more, more information about leverage, yeah. I'm kind of like, okay, like I can explore this concept. I can keep, um, I can pull together stories which and curate things, which is kind of, you know, what I tend to naturally do anyway as a digital hoarder and just pull all this together and synthesize it and try to create new frameworks and exercises to kind of help people get their heads around this. And I mean, truly like there's, there is a, um, there's an evolved tweet about this that I won't try to paraphrase, but like, there's a gap and a growing gap between people who are like working with leverage and see the world through a lens of leverage and people who don't. Um, there's people who are like shocked and appalled by people who are getting 10 X the outcome of others, but it, and it's, they may not be appreciating that that person has taken responsibility for these very long levers that increase their output. And I say responsibility deliberately, because it's not just, you know, that they have, all upside, like you have increased risk, you have increased downside, you, um, you are assuming responsibility for a lot of things when you take on sure. leverage, it doesn't just yeah. make you more powerful or give you more control. It's, it's, um, you know, there's, there's a downside to all of that as well. Yeah. Your systems have to processes have to be buttoned up. Yeah. There's, yep. Um, so when you say that people are clamoring for more for you, that meant uh, a newsletter, certainly tweets now a course. Um, and this is sort of how I think of you now as like the leverage guy. I'm sure people are saying like, how can I do this? Or asking you about that. I'm sure people want you to consult and you're trying to think, Oh, this is the anti-leverage. Right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I'm, I, I, it is on brand for me to politely decline consulting requests. So, <laughs> yeah. It, it's very, um, I, I like to think of like, if you want the information by the book, if you want the outcome, buy a course because um, sure. like the courses are really a good course is designed to cl- help you close that gap between information and application um, to you actually like make the changes in your life that you desire um, that when information, when like here, just kind of consume this isn't enough to get you there. Um, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not, and it just depends on like where you are and what else you have going on and how likely you are to kind of go all in on one idea at one time and how much of yeah. a, you know, self-guided person you are and what your habits and structures are already. Um, yeah, I, I thought that this would be, I thought that a course was the right way to, um, course and community really, or the right way to continue to explore this idea and cool. make something that can continuously evolve and grow and compound and bring people together because, you know, the, the research conversations I had about this, so many people were like, yeah, yeah, give me more information and help me apply it. But also like, I just want to talk to other people about this. I want to see how other people are applying this. Yeah, so like yeah. case studies and community and all of that stuff is, is really um, important. And it's frustrating to like have this mindset that you think is really important and no one around you gets it. And you're like, I just want to learn more about this. I want to like see somebody nod and smile other when I talk like about me. leverage instead yeah. of giving me a blank look. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And so we'll get, I want to ask about the course too, but um, if, if a leader is listening to this or an aspiring leader, maybe this is sort of the curriculum of the course. Is there five types of leverage or a framework for like, you know, people, time, scale, tools? Mm-hmm. Talk about that. Yeah, there, there's um, the course is really broken up into kind of three main arcs um, that show this like semantic tree. Um, but basically, we classify four main types of leverage tools, product, people, and capital. Okay. Um, and so there are a number of kind of frameworks we use to help people chart their leverage as it exists today, chart the opportunities, um, the nearby opportunities for leverage, chart the long term. Um, we call it that like the metaphor we use is the mountain of levers. That's what the course is called, building a mountain of levers. Okay. And 
just using this kind of uh, mental metaphor and these frameworks for looking at different opportunities. Um, people tend to be really strong in one or two of those kind of four types. Mm. Um, they're either prone to like shiny object tool syndrome, or they're really confident um, people person and manager and leader. And uh, so that's like a, almost a personality. You can almost kind yeah. of identify who would be good at which one. Yeah. Um, and there's, and then there's usually one that they're totally blind to and don't think of of leverage as a, at all. Um, for some, for like software developers, that's often people like they're trying to avoid sure. using people and they, they, tend towards tools and products. Um, and then the other, the other categories that are aware of one of the types, but they don't, they have like a mental block about using it. Hmm. Um, so like they think of capital's leverage, but I don't know how to like apply it such that it gives me leverage. I just know that it's there or I'm, I know that it's there, but I'm afraid to spend money because I don't know how to evaluate the, like the yes, risk return yeah. of that particular type. Um, so it's very interesting to talk to like a wide range of different people and see kind of how it all breaks down um, and then see the learn from each other. Right. So like the software developer has this amazing um, like automation system for his publishing routine, uh, but, but not sure how to like use some of the people and task-based labor that somebody else has set up as their like personal kind of meal system. And it, like, it's yeah, just yeah. really cool to see where people optimize. It's so like your agency friend or say me at Lemonly, right? We're a team of uh, 17 people. Am I then deploying capital leverage or people leverage or are those tickets? Like if I'm paying people to do the work, is that you, considered people? I'd consider that people. Yeah. Okay. Um, like th there's a, there's a little bit of a capital cycle where like the, Spend you can money employ to make people. Money. Yeah, you employ different types of leverage, and those leverage, uh, those types of leverage have different kind of margins, and then you reinvest the earnings from that leverage application into longer levers or more levers um, or different types of levers. And so over time, you're kind of building up. And what we, one of the things we do in the course is help people start with really small, manageable things. So in the people kind of type, um, it can be really intimidating to say like, yeah, go hire somebody. And you're like, oh my God, that's uh, now I got to manage payroll. Now I got to manage like health insurance. I don't know how to do any of this. Also the cost is huge. And I don't know if I'm going to, you know, recoup on that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we say like, okay, start with, you know, really individual managed like task-based labor, like go to fiverr.com and hire somebody to do a thing that is really well-defined and your downside's limited to 20 bucks and 20 minutes. Yeah, like that's people leverage, but it's tiny manageable bites. And then you kind of go up from, okay, maybe now hire a VA. Now maybe hire a part-time kind of person. Now you're looking at your first kind of full-time employee. And so like cool. just figuring out how to make those manageable bites and what the ladder looks like for each of those types and when to kind of take the next step on each one. Yeah, I love that. And so if somebody were listening to this and wanting to kind of dip their toe of those four categories, do you is there one to start with or do, you, do they first take inventory of maybe... They're just what's at their disposal. Yeah, I think the first steps in inventory. So I mean, it's okay. super simple. Just you know, three lines down the middle, chart out the four, and start making a list. Um, cool. See where you're at. See where you're strong. See where you're weak, and then uh, you know, try to take like the smallest next step that you can. Probably at your weakest point, because um, mm -hmm. you're probably already going to work on your next strongest point. So like, sure. Look, look for your bottleneck, I guess, and, or your biggest opportunity and figure out a way to, to kind of leverage that. Um, and these are, you know, frameworks that we have in detail in the course, but like, if you want to just try it for yourself and see cool. like where you can get, that's a good way to start. Hey, going to take a really short break here uh, with the episode with Eric to remind you, I would love, love, love you to leave a review, five-star review or a comment of the Lead More podcast, even better if you can. Um, if you're an Apple person, subscribe. If you're a Spotify person, click follow, where you can go and follow and subscribe. The more people that do that, it tells those platforms that this is a good show and that more people should listen to the show. And that helps us out a lot. Then more people can discover it. And we can do more great episodes. So just wanted to quickly remind you of that. Thank you so much, of course, for listening back to the show. I think it's very like sort of right in front of us and obvious, but also like what you're talking about is pretty like high level concept to really think of it holistically, philosophically, to, but then to apply it in day-to-day -day life. Yeah. It's a, it's interesting to see. 
I, I'm very interested to uh, like, I wish I could get a snapshot of five years and see <laughs> where people who consistently practice this are going to end up because it's a little, you know, it's, it's almost like that old E-Myth revisit thing. Like, are you working in the business or on the business? Like, yeah. Yeah. are you, are, are you going to spend your whole life just kind of working in a linear relationship or are you going to learn to look down from above and learn to work on the work work on doing the work that gets more work done um, and increasing your capacity over time so that in five years or 10 years, the same incremental hour of effort is amplified by, you know, an agency of 20 or an audience of a hundred thousand or mm -hmm. what, or, uh, you know, a much larger capital base. Um, and I think, yeah, I think in even in the course you mentioned like, Hey, you want to make $50,000 a year. Once you have a million bucks, you can, right? Like yeah. interest or investing or yeah. Yeah, I, that's, um, you know, it gives a, it gives a mindset of appreciation for your future self. And, you know, learning, it, it, this is the same, I, I think the reason I took to this um, so quickly in part is because I worked really hard to hammer compounding into my head. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, I've been a big, like Buffett and Munger fan for a long time, and like read all the stuff and go to the meetings. And I think, you know, Warren Buffett is Warren Buffett, because he very, very early on understood compounding. Um, and that was like the idea that dominated his life. And every time he made a decision about like whether to buy a $1 ice cream cone in 1950, he did the math and compounded forward. And he was like, wait, that's a $50,000 ice cream cone by the time I'm 85. And do I really want that ice cream cone or do I want to just put that money into, you know, seize candies? Um, I've used the one I so think I you think tweet, tweeted it, honestly, like $1,000 before your 30s before you're 30 spent is a month of retirement at the end of your life. I think you tweeted that maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, I forget the napkin math between those two things, but um, it's, yeah, it's one of those, you know, and compounding is similar to leverage in that it's, you know, it's very mathematically sound, but counterintuitive. And it, it doesn't come with, um, we are not good at extrapolating that math mentally. Like when you sit down with a compounding table and you, you know, double an amount every seven years for however long you have to double it, you're like, holy shit, that's a lot of money. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the same mental exercise applies when you're thinking about leverage, when you think about like, well, what will you get if you write, you know, one blog post every week for the next two years? Oh, I'll have a mailing list of maybe 40,000. Then what does that do? Like the, the ability to look at the long-term outcome of your work um, over and over and over again, and be really disciplined about being sure that you are only doing things, doing work that compounds, um, and doing work yeah. that does more work in the future. Yeah. The last thing I'll say on that, you kind of set me back, Eric, when you said, uh, this gap of like, who's using leverage and who's not. And I know that right now we're really talking about like an entrepreneur or a business owner, you know, yeah. someone scale, but like, what, one thing I wanted to ask you is like, this gap can even be on the, in the personal side. You might just be buying back time or spending more mm -hmm. time with your children or your spouse, your friends. Um, you know, you're a Midwest guy, so I'm not sure if this question will make sense, but I think in, in the Midwest, there's sort of this feeling of, um, Hey, we do, we pick ourselves up. We do the work. We, we take care of our ourselves, you know? So like if hiring the neighbor kid to mow my lawn while I spend time with my children is a form of leverage. Right. But maybe it's something seen as like a, Oh, John's lazy or he doesn't, he doesn't want to like, he doesn't even mow his own lawn. Right. Have you ever had any pushback on this concept? Yeah. I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of different forms of like psychological hesitation that like different people have before, uh, kind of diving into leverage and one that uh, like is very midwestern and was very deep in me is like this instinct towards self-sufficiency of just yeah. like oh i, I want to learn how to do it myself i want to do it myself i want to be seen to be doing it myself like i want um i can put it all on my back and handle it and that is just yes. like that is a better way of saying it yeah i mean you know oh the ox died like i'll, I'll pull the plow myself like um that's just very like I don't know if it's Midwest or just, you know, the kind of the family cultures that we grew up with, but like, that's definitely a value that I held, um, whether I realize it or not. And, and when you're trying to get yourself to do some of these, take some of these steps, yeah, it feels weird at first. Um, and so I think, you know, we try to help people work through that. Um, I have tried to work through it. I've tried to create some kind of mental shortcuts. Um, you know, the, the mantra that I repeat to myself here is one of our last, like, uh, laws of leverage is like, do the work only you can do. Um, 
And so that I, I kind of like, as I'm making my to-do list in the morning or, or, you know, getting reoriented for the month, I'm like, is this work that only I can do? Or like, can That's I good. hand this off? Is it going to be, you know, 80% as good if I can get somebody else to do it? And then what do I fill that time with? Is yeah. it a higher or use of my time, um, whether personal or professional? Cause I think, um, you know, there, this is not a hustle porn situation where like, you know, let's figure out how to work a hundred hours a week, like the most effectively we possibly can. Um, and whether you are looking to 10 X your output or achieve one X your output with one tenth of the input, the math is the same. And the, the playbook is very nearly the same. Um, it, it still requires different forms of leverage and a knowledge of how to amplify your effort. That's awesome. I like that a lot. Um, two more, and then we'll, we'll get to a little, some little rapid fire at the end. I wanted to ask briefly about the course because you built this course, um, I think just launched recently. Um, but you also have this little side project where you're a course, course correctly, right? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. And so you're sort of curating or maybe like reviewing courses. Cause now that cor- starting courses is like the big thing. Yeah. They're, they're such an interesting, um, it's basically wire cutter for online courses. And so we're yeah. trying to kind of pull together some, um, great reviews. It's, I, I found it really hard to find information from a third party about courses that I wanted to take online. Everybody's got a beautiful landing page. Um, but it's hard to know which stuff is right for you necessarily. And I do think the internet is like this incredible infinite frontier of things to learn. And you can kind of, I mean, there's crazy amount of courses out there. Like when you start yeah. going down rabbit holes, you're like, this is. Well, so this is maybe exactly why you want to do this idea because yeah. as a, per, as a person who my mantra is like better every day, right? The concept yep. of 1%. And so it's like, as a person who likes to learn probably has a little bit of disposable income, uh, but also like believes in the power of leverage. I want to, I want to buy every damn course out there. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, my inbox is full of these course emails that I just haven't done or haven't finished. And so yeah. what have, what have you learned by both building one? And I'm sure you've taken some too. Like what, how do you truly gain leverage from these courses or is there a recipe that makes some more effective or what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting, um, it's an interesting space because it's still evolving really quickly. And so we have these kind of like super premium, like cohort based, very live, very involved, very intensive stuff like on deck and mm-hmm. you know, David Perel's course. I mean, they're thousands of dollars and they're very well, uh, they're, they're community driven and there's like whole staffs associated with it and mentors and all kinds of stuff. Um, and if you, if that is your like number one priority in life, I think those are like amazing, you know, you're approaching that as a, like, I am at an inflection point and I really want to like become the kind of person that this course is going to make me become. Yeah. Um, but there are huge commitments and they're synchronous. And so there's some challenges around that. Um, I mean, that price point is not accessible to a lot of people. And then the total other end of the the pendulum, you have these like 10 to $20, like pre-recorded video things that are like, here's how to yeah. do a thing that you might want to know how to do. Um, yep. Yep. And both of them are huge industries and growing and then everything in the middle, which is kind of where we are. And what I tried to do with this course, after having learned what I can learn from both of those is to create a really scalable, accessible, evergreen set of material that is useful for anybody on the planet. And then at the same time, uh, build some also scalable, but to the student really, really um, small group, high kind of accountability, social like component um, so that we can have an evergreen course and not have to define ourselves to specific times or specific dates, um, but also give people a sense of community um, at different scales, right? So like one-to-one, one to, you know, five or 10, and then the broader community that is just kind of like collaboratively building resources and allowing people to kind of match up yeah. with that. So yeah. um, that's what I mean. I'm excited to see if we can bridge that gap and be like the best things of an evergreen course and the best things of a really high end expensive, like uh, community driven course. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. And you're right. It's so, it's so rapidly changing. And, and that's another one, like in five years, I'm curious what that'll look like, right? There's the like, yeah. education, traditional education is dying. Like don't go to school, but like, can we just do on deck? I don't know if they're like, where's, <laughs> where's the middle ground there. Right. Like, yeah, I, I do. I, I believe so much in the power of education and it's so exciting to see like a quickly evolving horde of 
you know, entrepreneurs and teachers and innovators kind of like going after that space and new platforms and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, cool. yeah, it, it'll be, it's a fun place to, to be working and a cool thing to watch. Well, last thing I want to ask you, I think it's on your Twitter bio, but you say, um, unemployed, uh, and then you have these projects that you're working on. Right. And so you said I'm recently W2 listed. And so would you consider yourself a creator? Are you going to always do projects? Are you going to have a job? I mean, I don't want to say forever, but like, where do you kind of see yourself right now in this ecosystem in the, in the lens of, of how you're trying to gain leverage? Yeah. I'm, I'm not even creator seems to be like kind of a new label, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure who it applies to yet. Um, like, I don't know. I just like doing projects. Um, and I'm, I've got like a decent dose of like career ADD. So, um, uh, I, I like the ability to jump around and do different things and then focus really, really deeply on something like a course for, you know, six months to a year and build something that can mm-hmm. kind of continue on. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I certainly can't say I'd never take a job again or start another company again. Like I think both of those are, are possible. Um, but I'm just having a lot of fun, like, you know, pr- with projects big and small at the moment. Yeah. And, uh, that's, you know, we'll see, we'll see where that goes. Um, well, selfishly, I love to ask these questions cause I'm sort of like yeah, going six months thing. away from trying to figure out the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be on, a, I'll be W2 listed here in uh, January. So, <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Let's finish with a few rapid fire. So you wrote a book, but what's a book that you often most would recommend to somebody or give to? Um, I love, I love personally love the systems Bible and it's one that like, uh, is just, there's kind of nothing like it. Um, so for people who have done a, it, it is not an easy read, um, uh, but okay. it is a fun read. It's just like, it's like mock dry. It's kind of like how I describe <laughs> okay. it. So like I laugh out loud when I read it, but like, it is not designed to be a crowd pleaser in any way. Um, but if you are like, trying to if it's been a while since you've read a book that like made you think in a new way uh and you're looking for one and you're Mm -hmm. willing to gamble on it like i would try that um like that yeah it's a good review systems bible um how have you unplugged over the last 12 plus months when we've been in a pandemic um daily basis is just like the gym and um you know hot tub sauna like that I, that is my meditation hack is like i have a hard time sitting in my living room and meditating but um if i'm in a hot tub it comes very naturally uh and then it, like just time in the woods and nature um I'm trying to trying to get away from a screen and um you know the place where you spend all that time yeah i like that um so we asked this question when we hire at lemonly uh what because it makes people brag about themselves, which our mid us Midwesterners aren't usually very good at. So what's your superpower? What's the one thing Ask, you think you do uh, best? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if it's the thing I do best, um, but it's the thing that I do most naturally, which is kind of uh, collect and curate and synthesize. Um, mm. I like I jo- the joking version is like a digital hoarder, which I think I, I said earlier in my pocket is just like overflowing. Um, but it's the thing that kind of all of my projects have had in common. Um, as I, as I look back on them and the thing that I can, you know, kind of sit down and start doing and forget that it's been 12 hours. Um, yeah. it, and it's broad well, enough that yeah, it can happen across any different thing right so like you know a few a few months ago i was like i really just want to get my head around blockchain and so that was like a, a week or four of of like reading of you know books and podcasts and blogs and then um having conversations and trying to distill it down and when i can when i feel like i can take a new idea that i did not used to understand and take somebody who is also who is uninitiated to it now and bring them you know Feynman style through all of the in, in simple language from the beginning um and then have them kind of see what I see in it by the end. Um, and it's like, Hey, I just saved you a month of like doing all that work. Um, cause I, yeah. I, cause I got the right pieces in place to have this conversation in an hour. And if you're asking, you know, the questions that you're curious about, I can, I have an answer for you because I have worked through that already. Um, like that's a really rewarding feeling. Um, 
and, well, and hugely and underrated skill. I think the world's just moving faster. Uh, the topics are changing quicker. Um, and, and yeah, most people, I'm kind of a dabbler. I feel like I go mm-hmm. like an in, inch deep, maybe a mile wide, uh, but to be able to go to dive in and then really synthesize and digest is tough. Yeah. I mean, and it's, it's frustrating how many of those rabbit holes I want to go down and, and can't, right? Like that's sure. the, um, and I still, I mean, you know, a mile deep, I, I maybe go 10 feet deep and that's enough, but then you find somebody who's like done this for 10 years and you're like, whoa, like, yeah, you, th- that's, um, I, I think it's helpful like as a society to have people at all the different yeah. like depths of things. Um, but you always want to go, you know, deeper and into more areas. And you're right. There's always someone who's been, who's yeah. been deeper, right. So you find that person and follow them. Well, the last question we ask on the show uh, is who are the leaders that have inspired you? So, you know, this show is about creating more leaders, inspiring people to step up and say, yeah, maybe I can lead. Who are the ones who have shaped your life, whether you know them or you've just studied them? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, my family is, I'm very lucky to have kind of a family that I look up to everybody in. Um, cool. You know, bo- both my parents are, are absolutely wonderful. And then I had a string of truly fantastic humans um as bosses pretty much without exception um, that's awesome that uh that i've learned something from and, and taken something from um i mean I'm, I'm grateful to everybody who has like taken the time to write a book that i've read um and i think that's an underrated source of just like you know long dead people who took the time to write their stuff down um so that people in the future could get their head around their experience and their beliefs and their understandings. And I think that, you know, the more eyes you try to see through um, the more people you understand and the more people you can find empathy for the more of the world you understand. And um, we are all better for taking the time to do that every once in a while. That's a good line. Yeah. And talk about, maybe it's the very first, well, maybe not, maybe, it's, but maybe it's, maybe the wheel would be the very first form of <laughs> leverage, but I'm thinking like a book, talk about leverage, right? Like long dead people whose words still live years and years beyond them. Yeah. That's, that's, um, you know, product leverage in a nutshell Product is a little bit of a confusing term because people think of it like a, you know, software product, but sure. it's, it is a product of you. It's a product of your mind. It's preserving a piece of your experience or expertise or knowledge or, um, or a rule set that you follow. So a software program is a product of your mind that encodes, you know, rules and instructions. Um, a book is, you know, whether it's a story or, you know, your diary or whatever it's, it is pulling out that experience and putting it into a format where it can serve a hundred people or a thousand people or a million people. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the books that have been around for millennia are some of the longest levers ever. Um, yeah. and yeah. we continue to reprint them and share them and talk about them. And, um, those, those individuals have touched so many people. And I think that's, that's, what's interesting to me about, you know, a lot of great art or artists or, you know, craftsmen is, is the like scale that those things can reach when they're truly exceptional. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I feel about the show. Like, will my daughters ever want to listen to, you know, Eric and I talk on a podcast, maybe not, but like, if they do, like it's, it's there. Right. And it lives beyond this moment in time of you and I talking live. It'll be a really interesting shift. Um, from like the cost of recording has gone down so much that this is the first generation that we are living through that has like so much of them recorded. You know, I wish I had more of, of my grandparents and my parents yes. recorded and their life. Um, and that'll continue. Like we will have more of that unless you assume it's just like the VHS problem where it all just disappears anyway, because sure. of like, you know, media form evolution. factor, yeah. Form factor evolution. Yeah. Um, so it'd be interesting to see kind of what happens there. Like we'll be so much better documented. Um, but also there'll be this ocean of stuff like, <laughs> you know, um, will the signal just be lost in the noise? Uh, or will it matter a lot to, to kind of a handful of people? Um, yeah. we'll see. But I think okay any, anybody, yeah. yeah, anybody recording anything and throwing into that ocean is, is like adding to the, um, you know, it is like throwing a hat into the ring of meritocracy and like they're getting better and they're adding to it. And, you know, this, this like 
um, wait, but why calls like the human Colossus um, is just like the recording ability and the, the, the low cost of creating products um, is a huge piece of that. And it's going to yeah. like, we're just starting to see like what kind of impact that's going to have on the inflection point of like growth going forward. Yeah. I like that. That's a good spot to end. Um, well, thank you. This was great. I hope that somebody, you know, listens to this and maybe does a little a pause or a little thinks about their life in a sort, sort of quarter turn of how they can think about leverage and, 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 and approaching their leadership style. Um, Eric, how can folks, if they want to, you know, learn more about this or, or wrap their head around this topic, how can they get in touch or follow you? Yeah, I'm on, I'm on Twitter way too much. Um, just my first and last name. Uh, my personal site is ejorgensen.com. Um, and you click on leverage there and they'll have a ton of blog posts and, um, stuff to keep reading. I am easy to email or DM or whatever. Um, and love to talk about this. I think there's a lot, um, more to explore about how to help your team or, um, your company kind of become more leveraged. You know, a leveraged company is made of leveraged teams is made of leveraged people. Um, yeah. and so there's, there's just a lot to explore there. And I think, um, leadership is inherently high leverage and when it's done well and when that example is set for others um you can see some really tremendous outcomes uh in in all kinds of industries and um just kind of a, a change of mindset and priority yeah that's fantastic i love that great place to end eric thanks for the time today thanks john take care all right that was our episode with eric jorgensen i hope you enjoyed it some really great dialogue, some awesome topics, and hopefully something in there that you can take and use as a leader, aspiring leader, apply some leverage in your life and you know, see what happens. All right, that's it for this week's episode. Reminder, we drop new episodes every Thursday, wherever you subscribe to podcasts, subscribe on iTunes, follow on Spotify, and look out for the next episode of Lead More every Thursday. Thanks so much. Take care and be well.